Hi, it's Dwyer. It is Friday the 13th. Let that be an omen. It's August 13th, 2021. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. I've already been up for a number of hours. I got my Noah's coffee here. <clears throat> Good coffee, by the way. Good sandwiches, too. And uh, looking at the lay of the land in terms of betting, let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider the, this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, for those of you interested in betting on the Joshua Buatzi versus Ricard Bolonik fight, a full breakout of the odds for that fight, and I'm not endorsing anything here, we're just referring to this site for informational purposes, but a full breakout can be found at bovada.lv. <clears throat> bovada is spelled B-O-V-A-D-A -A dot L-V. If you look up this fight, they'll give you round by round what the odds are and different scenarios on whether the fight goes a distance, whether it doesn't, whether someone wins by decision, whether someone else wins by stoppage. Let's work through the thought process in placing a bet here, because at first, the fight looks unbettable. What I also want to point out, too, what I want to highlight, is that when you're betting, <clears throat> sometimes it's not about betting on who you think will win the fight. Sometimes it's just an attempt to take advantage of an opportunity and to break even if it doesn't happen. So right now, the unbeaten Olympic bronze medal winner, Buatsi, who is very dangerous, is going off as a 10 to 1 favorite. Right? They're telling you that if these guys fought 11 times, Buatsi would win 10 of the 11. Understand, on the Bolinek part of the play, the house is taking a hefty vig. So you're only getting a plus 550, right? 5.5 to 1. Let's make this play bettable. Let's talk styles. Let's eliminate some outcomes. We're just looking for a profit-making opportunity. We're not trying to, you know, go with who we think is going to win the fight. I know that's what most gamblers do, but we're not going to do that here. We're just looking for an opportunity we can exploit. <clears throat> now, the fight is a 12-round fight. Folks, that's a lot of rounds. Buatzi looks calm. He's the ultimate poker player. He looks calm. He's unassuming. He looks gentlemanly in the ring. Right? Just understand that if he gets at 10 o'clock on you, right? If he is on your left side, right over your left shoulder, he's an absolute killer. Right? This is a heavy-handed guy pretending to be mild-mannered. His right hook up top is an A-level punch. It'll hurt you. It'll knock you down. It'll end the fight. So understand, the kind of fighter who would give Buatzi problems would be a Caleb Plant, a mover, a guy who's not going to give him that angle, right? What Buatzi's trying to do is to set up that angle. So he's showing you an above-average jab. He has a pretty good jab. He's engaging you in some sparring. But what he really wants to do is to slip over to this spot right here 
and then throw that concussive right hand, right? In many ways, for the old timers, he's like Ingemar Johannesson, right? I would encourage people to look at the uh, Johannesson fight against Macon, right? Same type thing where Johannesson had a lethal, lethal right hand. But he wouldn't show it that much. He'd keep it in the holster. You'd forget about it. Then, of course, he would get up close to you, hit you with it, and then you might not remember anything else about the fight as you got counted out. Right? Put differently, Macon, Machin, however you pronounce it, went 12 rounds with Prime Sonny Liston. Right? I believe against Johannesson, he gets stopped in the first or second round. Well, Buatzi is the same way, mild-mannered, very lethal right hook. Now, he is the better athlete than Bulanik. Right, He's the better athlete. He's going to be shooting a jab early. Fighters who can maintain that jab can disarm Bolinik, who isn't good at reading movement, right? He's a stalker. He's a hunter. He wants to walk forward. He wants to walk you down. Forget the back foot, right? His game is to stay outside, wait for you to finish throwing the jab, right? He has a high guard. He wants you to get tired throwing the jab. So he can then come inside. And here's the secret to this fight. He wants the same angle as Buatzi. Right? He wants to come up at 10 o'clock off your left shoulder. But he has different plans. His best punch, in my opinion, is his right hand to your body. So both of these guys are going to be angling for the same angle. Neither of these guys uses a lot of lateral movement. So I'm expecting Buatzi to win the early rounds. When he has a lot of energy and he's trying to figure out the angles, he's going to be throwing a jab. That's going to be enough to win the early rounds. Right? Because Bolinik knows he doesn't have the hand speed to compete with you in the early rounds. This is a patient fighter. So he's going to give away the first three rounds of the fight, in my opinion, to Buatzi. Then, of course, the real fight's going to start. Where Buatzi's going to think he knows the angles, and he's going to try to get over on the left side right, of Bolinik. Bolinik is going to let him get over on the left side. The question's going to be, who hurts the other one first? The difference between the two guys is while Bolinik looks muscular, the puncher in the fight is the mild-mannered guy, Buatzi. So, Buatzi at a minus 1,000 is unbettable. But, if you, like me, believe that this fight does not go the distance, then we have stuff to work with here. Now, I privately feel that Buatzi wins the fight. But the opportunity is not there to take him. Right? I want him as part of a hedge. But I want to swing for the fences here. So, understand that Buatzi by stoppage is a minus 365. More intriguing to me, and this is just an odds play. It's not even an opinion on who wins. Because I feel both guys will be going for the stoppage. 
because I believe 12 rounds are too many rounds for both of these guys. Because I feel neither guy is that gifted on their back foot. Neither guy is that much of a mover. The bet that intrigues me here is Balanek. I'm not saying he wins the fight. What I'm saying is if he wins the fight, it would be by stoppage. The play I like here is Balanek by stoppage at a plus 675. Right? A plus 675. Hedged with Buatsi by stoppage at a minus 365. Let's do the math here. Let's offer a betting scenario. So, I have $14 that I want to bet on this fight. I go to the window and I realize that if I take Buatzi, who I think wins the fight, at a minus 1,000, I would be getting back on a $14 bet. The return of my $14 if I win plus $1 and 40 cents. That's my net. One dollar and 40 cents. For that reward, taking a side here is not worth the risk. So let's say I'm clever. I'm an experienced gambler. I break the $14 into two pieces. I put $11 at a minus 365 on Buatzi. 11 on him. If I win, then I get $3.01 back. Right? Understand, we're not taking Buatzi at a minus 1,000 to win the fight. We're taking him here by stoppage. Right? By stoppage. If I take Buatzi by stoppage and I put $11 on him, at a minus 365, I stand to win $3.01 back. $3.01. Many of you are laughing. That's not worth it, right? But understand, that's not our real play here. Our real play is then putting that $3 in expected winnings on Bullenick at a plus 675 by KO. If Bullenick wins by stoppage, I win $20.25. Minus, of course, the $11 that I've bet on Buatzi. So for the $14 play, I would win $9. Right? And change. There it becomes worthwhile, especially since it's hedged. Because if Buatzi wins by stoppage, I lose nothing. I don't win money. But because I figured out that the fight's going to end by stoppage, and because I have money on Buatzi by stoppage, if he wins by stoppage, then it just cancels out. I win $3.00. I lose three dollars. That's the play I like here. But I need for betters to understand the risk involved, right? And we're being creative here because the casino has been clever with the odds, right? Understand how clever the casino has been. If I just took the fight not to go the distance, right now on Bovada.lv, I'd be getting a minus 600. In other words, I wouldn't even get exposure to the plus 675 on the underdog by stoppage. Right? But I need for you to understand the risk involved in this play, which is to take Buatzi by stoppage, minus 365, bet 11 to win $3, and then to take Bullenick by stoppage, 
at a plus 675. Bet $3 to win $20.25, right? $20.25 minus 11 if the underdog wins by stoppage. Nets you $9.25, right? If the favorite wins by stoppage, you live for another day. But just understand you lose it all. You lose all $14. If the fight goes the distance, regardless of who wins, right? Full disclosure, I've been on here suggesting bets like this for years. Sometimes they've won. Other times, to my amazement, the fight between two sluggers, Carl Froch, Arthur Abraham, has gone the distance and I've lost it all. This is the risk-taking part of the internet. There is heavy risk involved here. Right? I'm just speculating on the styles here. Looking at a lack of lateral movement. Looking at two guys who want to have the same angle. So they could throw their best punch. And thinking to myself, if both guys are aiming for the same position to try to throw home run punches. This fight's not going the distance, right? So just be aware of the risk. The underdog, ironically, after waiting outside the early rounds, is going to try to create constant pressure, right? Just understand that the heavy-handed guy is the guy he's going to be walking into who might not have a developed back foot at this early stage of his career and who might not have faced major adversity. Let's shift it up, right? Let me just say some of you, in talking about Errol Spence, have made a distinction between a detached retina, which is definitely career-threatening, right? A detached retina is the worst. And a torn retina, where there's more hope, right? The idea is that most of your retina is attached, but there's a tear. Okay, great. What I want people to consider is that they're variations, right? They're variations. I don't want folks to get caught up in semantics and then to leap to the conclusion that, oh, they're telling us that in a routine exam, Errol Spence was examined by three doctors. Do you really think the State Boxing Commission has the kind of money where they're going to have three doctors look at one boxer's eye. No, no, you get a second and a third opinion because that first diagnosis is a doozy. Right? I don't want people to lead to the conclusion that because three doctors said it's a torn retina, that that's not that bad. And that Errol Spence is going to be back in the ring getting hit on that eye, sparring, preparing for a fight in a matter of months. Because as Spence has told us, I've come back from worse. Now let's slow the roll a little bit. First, the line, I've come back from worse. You know what? When you're a young, starving fighter, when you're starting out, when you have dreams, and, you know, you don't have a lot of money in your pocket, you'll be shocked what you'll be able to come back from. I'm guessing there are a lot of people in their 50s and 60s in life, people all over, in every city, who look back at their starving 20s and who think to themselves, man, I put up with a lot of stuff back then. They think about situations they were in, they think about jobs they had, and they know, man, I would never go back to that ever, right? Understand, Errol Spence now is in the part of his career where he's wearing, you know, uh, silk pajamas, right? He's in the millionaire part of his career now. 
So he can say, hey, I've come back from worse. Yeah, that was when you were young and starving. Now you're not young and starving. Now you're established. Right, so when you're young, you're rolling the dice. Understand, you've had several fighters, Joe Fraser, fight multiple fights. This is by his own admission before he died. Blind in one eye. Understand, you had Harry Greb, Hall of Fame fighter. He dies during the autopsy. They find out that he's been blind in one eye. You've had a lot of fighters take risks. Take big risks in fights to reach the top shelf, to reach where Spence is now. That doesn't mean that after they've reached the top shelf, if they hear there's a chance they're going to lose their vision, that the guy's going to take the same risks. Let me also say, too, detached versus torn. Folks, they're variations. Just Google the terms. You're going to find out that there's something called partially detached retinas. You even have detached and torn retinas. Folks, it doesn't have to be a complete detachment to be career-threatening. Let me also say, too, that when you get hit in the face for a living, Right? Your eye is bothering you and you think, oh, well, it's bothered me before. You can't tell the difference. You don't know that, oh, this time it's vision threatening. So, in my favorites folder, I have a video. It's an interview of Lehman Brewster talking about how he's in a fight against Sergei Lakovic. Very good fighter from a few years ago. And... Brewster, who had had problems in sparring with his eye, suddenly goes blind in the middle of the fight. Right? Who knows how long? You just don't have the information. Who knows how long Spence's eye's been bothering him? Right? Parts of the story don't make sense. This is a routine eye exam. Then they're acting like, oh, Perhaps Spence didn't know he had a torn retina. What about the alternative? Which is that Spence's eye has been bothering him, but he thinks this is part of the profession. Right? Understand, the timing of the surgery when you have a torn retina is crucial. Right? You need to get that fixed right away. You notice how, in Spence's case, he's already had the surgery. Because every second counts. If your retina is torn, if you have any disruption of blood to the retina, and it starts to go dark, you could lose vision. Let me say this too. Retinal problems lead to restricted vision, right? You don't have the range of vision that you had before. Well, could you imagine having restricted vision against Manny Pacquiao? Someone that fast, someone that sudden. Right, folks, had Spence gone forward with the fight, he could have ended up like Lehman Brewster, going blind in the eye during the fight. And, of course, if you're fighting Pacquiao, a fast-handed guy, and your vision field is restricted in any way, Spence might have not been able to see some of Pacquiao's punches. Understand, Manny Pacquiao, at 42, is still a puncher. I know some of you seem to feel that he doesn't have the power at 147. Folks, he dropped two sparring partners in preparing for this fight. Right? Understand, too, Pacquiao... His intensity is such that you've had guys like Oscar De La Hoya lose titles on their stool to Manny Pacquiao with several rounds to go, right? Just like against Lomachenko, some fighters say, that's it, I've had enough.
Nicholas Walters, right? Countless others. That's what happens in some Pacquiao fights. So pay close attention to the Spence situation. I believe that when a guy has money in the bank, and when a guy has privately been told by a doctor that his eye is at risk, and when a guy privately knows that he's been having problems making weight, haven't we been hearing that for years? You tell me, if Errol Spence, especially now that he's out of the ring, right, he's out of the ring, recuperating. You know, Errol Spence hasn't been in a hurry, let's be blunt here, hasn't been in a hurry to fight Keith Thurman. He hasn't been in a hurry to fight Terrence Crawford. Google his comments on Keith Thurman, where he's suggesting that Keith Thurman is a clown and he doesn't want to fight him for personal reasons. Okay, he goes up to 154, right? Understand, a guy like Brian Castano would love to fight him. Would go looking for Errol Spence. Are you certain that a guy whose game was dipping a little bit against Danny Garcia, for example, is going to be able to get in a rhythm in a heavier weight class that has people like Brian Castano? Erickson Lubin, folks, if I'm Errol Spence at this stage, I'm unbeaten, right? My record couldn't be better. 100% winning percentage. I'm unbeaten. I know that Sean Porter fight, we forget it, that Sean Porter fight was rough and tumble. I know that my game wasn't 100% by my own admission against Danny Garcia. I know that I've had problems making weight. Now you're throwing an eye injury in the mix, an injury that, in the rough world of boxing, opponents are going to target, right? If you're fighting Errol Spence, what are you going to do? Let me tell you, too. You're fighting old Errol Spence. He's beating the daylights out of you. You're going to think to yourself, man, there's no hope. Let me just try to survive this fight. You're fighting a guy who's had a major eye injury, Folks, you start targeting that eye. As bad as it gets, Errol Spence is beating your ass. As bad as it gets, you're thinking to yourself, man, if I could just hit that eye a couple of times, maybe I'll get Errol thinking a little bit. Then maybe I'll be able to land my left hook or whatever. Right? When you're fighting a guy coming back from injury, opponents are going to be much more inspired against him. So forgive me, maybe Spence makes it back. Let's be real, too. His first fight back, you really think it's going to be against Thurman, Crawford, Pacquiao? No, come on. You think he's going to say, I'm going up to 154 and I'm fighting Jamel Charlo or Brian Castano? No, that's not going to happen. So the Pacquiao fight, folks, that train has left the station. If Errol Spence comes back, he's going to be testing out that eye against guys who don't hit hard. You think his first fight back, he's going to say, hey, Sean Porter really tested me. Let me get back in the ring with Sean Porter. That's not going to happen. Let's stop kidding ourselves. This eye injury is a major turning point in Errol Spence's career. And since Errol Spence has already made his money, I'll be surprised if family members around him aren't quietly listening to him and saying, hey, son, you know, you can leave the sport now with your health. You know, hey, you know, the kids have some money in the bank here. Here, let's continue. A viewer asked me to comment on a great fighter, Roberto Duran. Let's talk about him here. I know there's a lot on Duran. I'm not going to get into the Duran you know. Right? One of the great lightweight champions in history. Think about what that means. That's Teofimo Lopez's division. That's 135 pounds. Right? 135 pounds. Understand, Duran is one of the gold standards at lightweight. 
right? When you think about lightweight, you're thinking about Roberto Duran, you're thinking about Benny Leonard, right? You're, you're thinking about very few elite greats. He's on the Mount Rushmore of lightweight champions. He was a lightweight champion for years, for years. Well, understand, there's a different Duran. The lightweight Duran is the guy who got inside, beat the daylights out of you in the pocket, right? Understand he gains weight. He fights Ray Leonard, unbeaten at the time. He beats up Ray from inside the pocket, right? The ability to fight inside is a signature of Roberto Duran. Also, somehow, when he was inside, he could hit you, but you couldn't hit him. Well, understand, that's only part of the Duran story. In the comment section of this video, I have Duran winning the middleweight title at the end of the 1980s. Right? Understand, Duran is lightweight champion for stretches in the 70s. This is Duran years later. Years later. And we're going to reference a fight. And understand, this wasn't Duran's first attempt at the middleweight title. Duran, in the middle of the 1980s, decided to try to climb the mountain. He fought Marvelous Marvin Hagler. And Duran went the distance with Hagler. Well, here's Duran back at the end of the 1980s. Right? The link to this fight is going to be in my comment section. And he's fighting Oran the Blade Barkley. Barkley's in his prime, 28 years old. Understand, this guy would beat Thomas the Hitman Hearns twice. Blade's on his game. Oran Barkley did not have an off night. Also, an argument can be made. In fact, I'll make it here that Iran Barkley hit harder than Roberto Duran, right? Because understand, Duran was a small guy gaining weight, right? Barkley was a middleweight. He's the middleweight champion. Let me also say, too, that Barkley has the reach advantage. Not that that would matter, because Barkley... It's like young Duran. He wanted to be in the pocket. He wanted to throw hooks. He wanted to take you out. Right? Barkley's also extremely accurate. You'll notice there are times in the fight where he catches Duran flush. But I want you to understand the difference between a skilled fighter and an all-time great. What I want people to do is to look at Duran in this fight. Folks, we don't think of him as a back foot fighter. Roberto Duran, as he gained weight, when he started fighting bigger guys, gets on his back foot. He fights this fight from the outside, and it's a masterpiece. Right? The first six rounds, quite frankly, I thought Barkley got the better of it. But as the fight continues, right, Roberto is able to have his moments. The seventh round, epic. The eighth round, epic. The tenth round, epic. The eleventh round, Duran drops Barkley, who gets up. He's so confused that at the end of the 11th round, Barkley doesn't know where his corner is. Now, this is the 80s. They let the fight continue. And Barkley, who himself was a warrior, makes it to the end of the fight. Right? Um, all I can say is, you look at Duran, the consummate inside fighter, you look at the head movement and spacing against Barkley, and you understand that this guy was a truly great fighter, right? Understand, too, this is Duran later in his career. 
He doesn't have a young man's reflexes. This isn't the style that made him famous. This is him on his back foot, head movement, throwing a jab, trying to set up right hands. And he does it magnificently. Right? Just understand that this game has different levels. If you want to see the Hall of Fame level, look at Roberto Duran. Let me close with this. You know, for some reason, many of you don't like Floyd Mayweather. Right? Whenever I mention him, somebody in the comment section always says, Floyd didn't beat Pacquiao, right? Quite frankly, I don't know what fight you were watching, but they say Floyd didn't beat Pacquiao. Floyd was running and stuff like that. I want people to look at this Joshua Buatzi fight carefully because I guarantee you Bolinick is going to be trying to walk down Buatzi. Now understand the genius of Floyd Mayweather. Very few fighters can do this. Mayweather would be in against the guy trying to walk him down. And Mayweather had the kind of defense where he did not have to back up in his prime. He could literally have you walk into his shoulder. Right? He would stand his ground. A guy would come, try to walk him, back him up into the ropes. And Mayweather, who was adept with his back up against the ropes, as Ricky Hatton knows, as Marcus Maidana knows, right? Uh, as Castillo figured out in the rematch. Understand, there were fights where Mayweather didn't go over to the ropes. Mayweather would stand in the middle of the ring, have you walk into a shoulder, and then Mayweather would dissect you. Buatzi is going to show us whether he's that level of fighter. He's going to have a guy who doesn't have a high KO percentage. But who wants to walk him down? Stalk him. Right? The question's going to be whether he tries to move constantly to stay away from the guy or whether he can let the stalker know, player, here's my shoulder. I'm not backing up. What's your next move? You know, you want to throw that left hook. Here I am. You know, I have that left hook blocked. You can't hit me in my back. What are you going to do? Right? Look at Buatzi's defense. If he has elite defense to go with this jab, this right hook up top, and a decent left hook, then boxing is going to be in trouble for several years. Right? Think Floyd Mayweather when you see Buatzi. Right? Um, Mayweather, of course, hair trigger left hook. One of the best in boxing. This guy, excellent right hook up top. It's not a left hand. Right? This guy's a blessed puncher. Understand, Mayweather used to be a blessed puncher, but Mayweather gained weight and wasn't a blessed puncher at higher weight classes. Right? But understand, this guy's a blessed puncher. He has a lot of skills. Don't let the quiet persona fool you. He has a Tony Thompson persona going on where you look at him and you say, hey, this guy reminds me of my neighbor. Right? No, no, this guy's a lethal puncher. The question is going to be his defensive skills against this kind of opponent who you know what he's going to do before the fight. Is this guy during the fight going to be prepared to have this opponent walk into a shoulder? Or is he going to get bullied over to the ropes? That's going to be a key part of this matchup. Anyway, that's how I see it. Thanks for sharing Friday the 13th morning with me. Hope you have a great day. I also hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.